pregnancy was an existential crisis. I know, I know it's not like that for so many moms, but for me it was traumatic. See, I daily wrestled with what it meant to become a parent. Every day, I wrestled with fear of inadequacy, with fear of the unknown, with the reality that I had absolutely no control over this baby that was developing, whether she'd be healthy, and I had no control over the world I was bringing her into. I had no guarantees at all. And so when my first baby, when Camden was born, my daughter, I had all this emotion I needed to process, and I wasn't sure what to do with it. So I did with it what I do, and I wrote. I actually, I wrote her a letter. That was 15 years ago, but I still remember it. And it started like this. Camden, today's headline read, world population expected to reach 7 billion. You are now one of that number. You are simply one as I am one. See, right now we're halfway through a sermon series called One in 100 studying Luke chapter 15. And we've learned that God's heart is like a shepherd's who will leave 99 sheep to look for the one who's lost. And last week we heard that God's heart is like a woman's who feverishly hunts and searches for her one missing coin, her treasure. And this week, we come to the story of the prodigal son. Now, every year, for years, Pastor Dave has taught this story, and he's held it out as essential to the heart of Riverbend. He goes so far as to call it our DNA. And with good reason, because for over 40 years, this church has committed its mission to welcoming everybody, just as you are, right where you are. It's been our heart to serve the battered and the broken and the bored. We want to be a safe place, a home for everybody, no matter what. But if we're going to identify our calling with this story above all stories, if we're going to say that this is who we are as a church, then I think we have to set this story into context. Because Jesus didn't speak this into a vacuum. You see, this wasn't just his passing thoughts or something he told for entertainment. And unlike some of the other stories he's told, it's not part of some larger sermon with strung together principles and ideas about what the kingdom of God is like. 
No, it has a very specific context. See, just one chapter earlier in Luke 14, we see Jesus enters into a Pharisee's house for dinner. And when he enters into that dinner party, he realizes that all the invited guests had picked out for themselves the best seats, all the positions of honor. And so to them, at that dinner party, he gives three teachings about dinner parties. He compares the kingdom of God to a great feast because he was targeting what he knew was their heart. And Luke 15, one chapter later, we see the same situation. Jesus enters into a context, and to that context, he speaks these three stories. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. But they're not random. He shoots them like arrows. Bam, bam, bam. Right at the heart of what he identifies as a real conflict in his audience. See, the church of Jesus' day... The world he was in, everything he was surrounded by, was stratified. The socio-political and cultural world of his day, labels mattered. Man or woman, slave or free. It mattered where you came from, your ethno-racial identity, it mattered. Were you Roman? Or were you Samaritan? Or were you Jew? Or were you Gentile? It mattered. It mattered whether you were rich or poor. It mattered whether you were healthy or sick. It mattered whether you were clean or unclean. And it was into this world that a conflict emerges because, see, Two very different groups of people from two very different ends of the spectrum end up in the same place. We see in verse 1, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. So let's say this side of the room. This side of the room, you are tax collectors and sinners. And see, here's the thing. This wasn't thrust upon you. You were unfit morally by choice. Everything about you, you had lost your soul. You were the rebels. Because see, tax collectors, tax collectors were by and large Jewish men who had bought the right to collect taxes from their fellow countrymen for Rome. They were seen as traitors, disloyal, greedy, and corrupt. And to be classified a sinner meant that your obvious lifestyle Your line of work, what I could tell looking at you meant that you had turned your back on God and on his laws and on his people and on what he cared about. And you did it by choice. Just to associate with you would make me unclean, would call into question my integrity. But then there was this side of the room. And on this side of the room were the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They were devoted to God. They were defined by strict adherence to all the laws and all the customs. So much so that the title Pharisee comes from a root word meaning to separate. They were set apart. They had made the opposite choices as this side. 
And see, it was not just that they were all in the same room, but the Pharisees and the tax collectors said, he welcomes them. And not just that, Jesus eats with them. Because, you know, to eat bread, to break bread, to sit down at a table, to have a meal with, meant I approve of you. I see you and it's okay. And that's what they had a problem with. And so to that conflict, to that audience, Jesus speaks. He tells them about the lost sheep. He tells them about the lost coin, and then he ups the ante. In verse 11, he says this. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them, and not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country, And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Now we tend to vilify the prodigal. We imagine him the way his older brother does, gambling and whoring. But technically, that's not what this says. That's not what this says if you read it closely. You see, I remember in my days as a criminal prosecutor, if somebody came to me and they said, I want to press charges, I'd say, okay, what you got? And they'd say, well, that person took their share of their money and they spent it foolishly. What would be my next question? What crime did they commit? What crime did they commit? See, it really interests me that when Jesus tells this story, he doesn't say he murdered somebody. He stole and he lied and he cheated and he raped and he pillaged. That's not in the story. What it says is he took what was his and he lived how he wanted. See, it was an exercise in free will. That firstborn daughter, Camden, she has always been fiercely independent. Fiercely. And I remember when I went to visit her third grade classroom, and I learned all of her favorite things, and I learned in that moment that her favorite number was 18. And with doe eyes, like a mom with her firstborn, I said, oh, honey, why is 18 your favorite number? And she prattled back, because that's when I leave home. (laughs) And she said it with all the confidence of one who had never known life without a home. Because, see, at that point in my career, I had spent my life meeting with kids who didn't have homes. My day job was sitting across from kids who would do anything, anything, anything to have a mom to argue with, to have a dad and his dumb dad jokes to roll her eyes at. But the beauty of her position was she was living a dream and she didn't even know it. And you know, nothing's changed with her. She's now a freshman in high school, and she is still counting down the days. (laughs) Counting them down. So I would like for you to join me in the irony of this story. Just this week, as I was preparing for this sermon, on our way to school, she tells me I need to deposit more money into her school account. Because girl tried to order her vanilla latte, And she had insufficient funds. (laughs) Yes. And I couldn't help but giggle to myself because I think for that one, 
18 might be a little bit of a wake-up call. (laughs) She might be a little less caffeinated. (laughs) But you know what? Sometimes it takes a distant land to figure that out. Right? Because see, the prodigal son treated his father like he was dead already. He severed relationship, and that was his prerogative to do so. See, here's the thing about God, and I marvel at it. God is relational. He's relational with himself, and he's relational with us. And he made us to be relational with him and with other people. But we don't have to reciprocate. When we drew our first breath, he initiated with us an unconditional covenant of love. He put an offer on the table for relationship. And he gave you the choice. He said, you don't have to accept it, but it's there for the taking. But that's the thing. We get free will. We don't have to acknowledge him. We don't have to stay home. We get to do what we want with the choice. See, the distant land really isn't a location. It's a posture of your heart. Going to a distant land is saying, you have no claim on my life. My life is mine. I'll do with it what I want. And what I love about this is that the prodigal son was on a journey. And the very same road that led him to a distant land also led him to come to his senses. Verse 14 says, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many Of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. See, walking away was part of his journey home. He didn't figure it all out right away. It took time. First, he had to deplete all of his resources and end up with nothing. Then he had to take a job he never thought he'd take, which led him to another first, craving pig slop. But see, it says when he came to his senses, He said, I'll turn back. You know, this week, preparing for this sermon, Pastor Dave asked me, how do you identify yourself as a prodigal? Gosh, am I embarrassed to admit this. But I had to admit that I don't. I don't. You know why? Because I'm the older brother. I'm the Pharisee. I'm the Girl Scout who has spent her entire life making the right choice, showing up and holding the line and doing her duty. But you see, that, that is exactly why I'm the prodigal. Because you see what rebellion and entitlement have in common? Arrogance. You see, when the prodigal son set off on his journey, he was so sure of himself. He had it all figured out. Just like the Pharisees 
were so sure of their superiority under the law. See, for us to come to our senses means we're going to have to lose the arrogance. For us to come to our senses means we're going to have to recognize a need. A need that we don't fill on our own. Verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, I love this part. We all know this part. While he was a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring the best robe, quick, and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger, and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Because the son of mine was dead, and he's come to life. He was lost and is found. See, the prodigal son thought that he'd somehow lost his father's love because of the choices that he made. And the Pharisees thought that they'd somehow earned it because of the good choices that they made. But you see, what makes grace grace is that it's undeserved. The minute I think that you didn't earn it and the minute I think that you did or I did, We've warped it. We've twisted it and bastardized it from what God meant. Because grace is a gift. The truth is, I go to a distant land and come back to my senses multiple times a day. It's true. I turn my back on God and then give him my face again. I run from pillar to post, shame to pride, lashing myself for when I got it wrong and lauding myself for when I got it right. And none of it, none of it affects how God sees me. See, if we're going to be a church for the prodigals, it has to start with recognizing that we are the prodigals. Every day we take what has been freely given and we squander it in a thousand different ways. None of that changes how God feels. See, Camden is my child. Her turning 18 and leaving my house isn't going to change that. You know, she can reject my offer of relationship. She can determine today that she won't speak to me ever again. She can turn her back on every promise and every resource that my home represents. And it's not going to change my unconditional love for her. That's her birthright. She got that the day I brought her into this world. And that's not going to change. See, that letter I wrote to her, it waxed on for a really long time. I was a new mom. I had a lot to work out. But it ended, when it finally did end, it ended like this. You are mine. I am yours. Your tiny life, the breaths you breathe in and out this very moment sleeping in your crib, they are mine. I love you hard, as your dad would say. I cradle you in my arms and I am holding my own heart beating outside my body. 
the weight of you, of who you are, of who you will be, is thick on me. This is why I write, it is a hunger to be known by you, to pour myself into you like an overflowing cup, an urge to tell you everything I know, a race against time and frailty, a fear that I cannot add a single breath to our time. You may be one in seven billion to the world, but you are the world to me. Guys, there's a reason Jesus didn't stop at sheep and coin. You are his child. This is his heart for you. If you've walked away or gotten lost or you're hiding, or you've packed up all your stuff and turned your back and decided this isn't for you, it doesn't change that. Or if you've just been righteously separated, thinking that somehow you've earned more because of everything you've done right, it doesn't change his heart for you. He's looking for you. His initiation of unconditional love and covenant, it stands. His offer of grace stands. The breaths you breathe in and out this very moment, the weight of who you are and who you're going to be is thick on him. You may be one, simply one, but you are the world to him. Would you pray with me? Father, may we be a church. You know, and I know, I know that like a revolving door, we're going to give you our face and give you our back multiple times a day. And I know that we're going to get it wrong. I know, Lord God, that we're going to run pillar to post. But may we be a church who remembers, who comes back to center and remembers that grace is a gift. And it wasn't just for us because now we found this place. It's for the people who aren't here yet. It's for the people outside these walls. This worship isn't for us. This church isn't for us. This place and this offer isn't for us. It's for them. Lord God, it's for them. We're here for Austin. We're here for the prodigal. We're here for the person who doesn't yet know that you're looking for them. God, may we be people who do the looking for you that aren't so busy being arrogant about our own stuff that we lose sight of the fact that we are looking for your harvest, Lord God. It's plentiful out there. It's plentiful out there, Lord God. May we care. May we extend the grace that's been given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.